Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be back here. Um, today I want to tell you about uh, work that I've been doing with uh, Nikolai Gromov, where we studied the holographic uh, description of quite uh, surprising holographic dual, what we call the strongly coupled gamma deform n equal to 4, which is something also called the fishnet. Let me uh, start with the uh, bottom line, which is our main result. The main result is for this theory, the first principle derivation of an holographic dual of a planar 4D CFT. And just to make clear what I mean by a uh, planar, in this talk I will only talk about the leading operator in the planar limit, which are single trace operator, and their dual description, which will be a sort of discretized, first quantized single string. So no uh, gravity or black holes, it's just a single string dual to single trace operator. What uh, this is good for, I think this is a good playground for ADS-CFT. In particular, we'll have an explicit holographic map between the CFT degrees of freedom and the bulk degree of freedom. And one of our uh, main motivation was to apply integrability tools, for example, for computing correlation function in n equal to 4, or using integrability in general. And this seems to be a very good playground. Doing so, such a thing, doing, giving a first principle derivation of an holographic dual requires, I think, some, a new idea. And if I try to zoom out and think what is the new idea that apply here, is that we are trying to think about the wave function in a four-dimensional conformal field theory that is dual to a local operator. This will be a bit of the main star of the duality. Okay. Let me start by uh, reviewing what is the fishnet model or what is the strongly deform n equal to gamma deform n equal to four superior meals. Is that meant to be a wave function or S3? You may uh, think about it. It will not be formalized in that way. But you may think about it as picking a very specific basis. Namely, I know this wave function. I know which operator is there. And I can use it to compute any correlation function of it. So it's, it's a kind of very specific basis for uh, describing such operators. I'll be very precise. So what is the uh, Sony gamma deform or the fishnet model? It's a very simple action. It's a four-dimensional theory. When we have two complex scalars, phi 1 and phi 2, which are n by n matrices, we have standard kinetic term and one four scalar interaction. I only consider this uh, model in the large n limit. The large n limit, tooth limit, when you take the size of these matrices to infinity, we keep in the analog of psi, which is the square root of the tooth coupling, fixed. Okay. What are the properties of this uh, model? First, it's non-unitary, because there is only one four vertex here. These are complex scalars, but there is no complex conjugate. Second, this model was shown to be conformal in the planar limit. Okay. You may wonder if it's also conformal at finite n. I will not try to address uh, this question, but let me just mention that this model is just one parameter in a, one model in a three parameter families. And one of them is the strongly beta deform theory of n equal to four. And uh, this one, the supersymmetric line, have also some fermions, and it's conformal all along the deformation. So this one at least is believed to be also conform conformal in the planar, in the finite end uh, limit, but I will not talk about it here. One other nice property about this model, it turned out to be integrable. And what I'll talk about today, that it's also holographic. So it's a bit surprising that such a model would be holographic. So why do we expect it to even be, have an alternative holographic description? One of the things one can study exactly some dimensions and correlation function in this model. And for some of them, one finds that the dimension of the energy scale as square root of the tooth coupling at strong coupling. And the three-point function or four-point function, for example, exponentiate, but what stands here is again the square root of the tooth coupling of this model. This is very footprint of a classical worksheet description that we are familiar with in n equal to four. On the other hand, one should be careful that <coughs> when taking the, the limit of strongly gamma deformed that leads to this model, one is taking the original tooth coupling to zero, which is from the point of view of the, if you start with the string in ADS5, 
it's a tensionless limit. So you would expect the string to become tensionless and therefore completely quantum and not showing any of this uh, property. However, on the other hand, one has to remember that in this limit we are taking a twist, or this gamma deformation can also be thought as a twist, which is kind of stretching this string on the sphere very, very much. In the double scaling limit where the original tension goes to zero, but the stretching, the extent of the string on the sphere become very, very large, one can remain with the classical theory if this uh, <coughs> effective tooth coupling is taken to be large. This is just to give some intuition of why this can happen. Okay. Let me uh, now for just formulate the problem. So the problem is given this Lagrangian in the planar limit derive a weak strong duality. That means a dual description where the action start with a tooth coupling, square root of the tooth coupling stand outside, that is dual to this model. The second step would be to take this uh, classical description and quantize it, and then compare the two also at finite cap. So how are we <laughs> going to do that? Let me first introduce what we call the quantum wave function of the CFT. So for simplicity, this model have uh, two type of uh, scalars, phi one and phi two. For simplicity, let's consider those that only charge under phi one rotation. They may, they may also have phi twos, but only in a neutral combination, an arbitrary spin. So we call the U1 sector. Just for simplicity, at the end, I would extend to any operator. Such operator, I'll call the CFT wave function, the correlation function of this operator with a trace of J conjugate scalars. And again, the reason for calling it a wave function is that in this model, knowing this function of uh, J four-dimensional axes is equivalent to knowing which operator is there. In particular, we can take it and use it to compute two-point function or any end-point function of this operator. Uh, <coughs> one of the reasons for that is the diagrammatics of this model are very, very simple. Think about this as representing, basically, the wave function. Here we have the operator in the middle, because we do some point splitting and separating the point. The only Feynman diagrams that contribute to this correlator are of this uh, fishnet type. Here the black ones are the phi one propagators, and the red lines, the wheels of <laughs> the fishnet, are the phi two propagators. And any intersection point here is a four dimensional interaction point that we integrate over 4D. What is nice about this model is that these are the only type of Feynman diagram that survives in the planar limit. There can be no black loops? There can be no? Black loops. No, if you are doing, for example, some, some black loop here, it will involve the four scalar interaction and its conjugate. And because the conjugate is absent, this is the only one that survives. Okay, okay so no other diagrams. This means that any, see at any given loop order, there is only one diagram that contributes, and this diagram by itself is therefore also physical. Let me introduce the, what we call the graph building operator. The graph building operator is an operator that acts on this correlator, on the wave function, and add to it one more wheel. It had J interaction point, which are these <laughs> J integrals here, the red propagator, the propagators on the wheel going around, and the spikes, the propagator that go up. So when we act on such a wave function, we add one more wheel in J loops. What I want to uh, claim, or to prove next, is that physical operator in this model, operator with the good conformal dimensions, are in one-to-one -one correspondence with those wave functions that are stationary under the graph building operator. Meaning that when we add to them one more wheel, we remain with the same wave function. Okay. The way to prove it is the following. Since we are only summing this type of diagrams, Resumming all the graph is just a geometric sum. Okay. Resumming all the graph is just given by this geometric sum in terms of this graph building operator. So suppose now we want to compute this uh, 2j point function. We just have to put here in the middle this geometric sum. Okay. Now, whenever you see such uh, an expression, the natural thing to do is put a complete basis of eigenfunction of the graph building operator. Okay and integrate over them, or sum over them. 
since B is uh, the graph building operator is a conformal operator, all these uh, <laughs> diagrams are conformal integrals, we can characterize their eigenstates by dimension and spin. Now, we take this expression and we put basically complete basis, which is nothing but for four point function, the conformal partial wave decomposition of the correlation function. You have to integrate over the dimension along the imaginary axis, shifted by two, and sum over spins. Now, what we'll do next is uh, go to uh, a point in the conformal cost ratios where heavy operators are <coughs> more and more suppressed. In this regime, one can close the contour of integration over the dimension. And on the way, pick the poles that are all coming from here. Okay. How do you know where the poles are? Is the The poles come from. Uh, B is uh, uh, self-adjoint with respect to the corresponding measure, yes, even though the theory is not unitary. So we see that uh, poles or physical operators are in one-to-one -one correspondence with <laughs> those eigenfunctions whose energy or eigenvalue of B is exactly one. This is the standard way of how to go from partial wave decomposition to conformal block composition of a correlation function. The nice thing about here is that we can write this very explicitly. Yes, it will uh, connect to what I said. The, the, the expression for E as function of these two variables is real. But we'll take the, uh, the parameter chi, the tooth parameter, and we take it in general to be complex. There is no reason to take it real. The theory is not unitary. And when one, 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 one would solve this equation, you're right. The, uh, the poles would, uh, would be uh, complex. Yes. So we conclude that uh, physical operator in one-to-one -one correspondent with stationary wave function under this graph building operator. So let's uh, do an example. The simplest example is length two, j equal to two. In this case, just from symmetry, the wave function must be equal to the three-point function. Mm -hmm. It's equal to this uh, function determined by conformal symmetry times some tensor structure for uh, higher spin. And one can plug it in and read the spectrum. So this are, we find in this case two physical operators, one of twist two and one of this twist four. And this is the expression, this function of the tooth coupling, a finite tooth coupling. One can also study the four-point function, which here is the four-point function of four of these uh, scalars by summing over all the poles. And this is nothing but the conformal uh, block decomposition, namely from the residue of the poles, we uh, read the three-point function. Now, you may be worried that uh, these are not, this is not really a four-point function of single trace operator. This is four-point function of four scalars in the fishnet model, but they are turned out to be uh, almost the same. Namely, one can consider really a four-point function of single trace operators in the model, <coughs> and uh, traces that made of the two scalars are protected operators. They don't get any uh, loop corrections in this model. And therefore, the, the only diagrams that contribute to this four-point function of single trace operator are exactly uh, this diagram that we took. Okay. Now this one plus the sum over other channels. So this is truly a, a four-point function of four single trace operators. So what is the data, therefore? We take this expression and take the strong coupling limit of them. If we take also the spin to be very large, we find these two uh, dimensions for the twist two and twist four operators. And the four-point function exponentiate in the right, in this form, where here uh, theta and rho are uh, the two independent conformal cross ratio of the four-point function in the center of mass uh, <coughs> frame. And you could put the two operators like that. Theta is the angle, and rho is the <laughs> length of this arm. So this is the data that any uh, classical strong coupling dual should reproduce. How do we uh, now go and derive the dual? We start from uh, this equation for the stationary wave function, and we think about it as an Hamiltonian equation coming from some word line time reparameterization symmetry. 
something. To be more explicit, we take this equation, this b minus 1, and we act on it with boxes for all the j external states. When we hit a box by one of the spokes, one of the external propagators, it gives us a delta function and therefore kill the integral in the graph building operator. So what we remain from that is just the propagators of the wheel that goes around. And when the box hit the one, this becomes the kinetic term. So we think about this equation as an Hamiltonian constraint coming from the following Hamiltonian. This square is quite a funny Hamiltonian. It's a product of the momentum of all the particles and then a product of all the propagators around the wheel. But if this is the Hamiltonian, one can go back and write the Lagrangian. And here is the Lagrangian in the Nabugoto type form. They wrote here, introduced the word line metric and integrate over it, and one finds the following action. You know what? First thing about this action, you know that the coupling, the two coupling just stand outside here. Meaning that whatever dynamics this action described become classical at stone coupling. And <laughs> the action itself is a product of the kinetic term <laughs> divided by the, the <coughs> propagators for all the particles taking to some uh, funny power of 1 over 2j. So th this is a very funny looking action a priori. It has a, a lot of symmetry. First, it has gauge symmetry, which is time reparameterization, which is what you use to derive it. And it's also a full conformal symmetry. This form is the full conformal group, not just Lorentz. What I want to uh, do next is to try to uh, take this action and make it more standard, more nice, by making all the symmetries manifest. Okay. And when we do that, we end with the following uh, action, which is equivalent to the, to the earlier one, but look much more standard. Here again, we have the tooth coupling standard side. Here we have standard kinetic term for J particles living on the light cone of R1, 5. Okay. So now we have a chain of particles living in five dimensions, which you should think about as the <coughs> boundary of ADS. It's an ADS when you take the radius and set it to zero. And here we have the interaction, which apparently looks like a product of all the <coughs> uh, nearest neighbor interaction on the chain. Now, this action, the here, uh, eta is uh, just a Lagrange multiplier that's fixed at x squared equal to zero. So we are on the light cone of R1, 5. Have we fixed the t of this? We did not fix it yet. I'm going to fix it in a second. This action still have time reparameterization symmetry. There's a dt and an x dot squared. Yes. So you, you can, I'll, I'll, this is exactly what I'm going to do next, OK? This action uh, come with a constraint, a Virasoro times constraint, the same as in string theory. They tell us that the Lagrange density is constant along the chain, is independent of this index k here. I'll call it L. And also that the kinetic term is the same up to some factor as the potential term. Okay. So when you see this action, you should have to take into account this constraint that comes from gauge fixing. Now, as you mentioned, these actions still have time reparameterization symmetry that acts on the field in the following way. And the way we'll uh, fix it, again, analog to what we do in string theory, is fix the Lagrangian density to be constant, and to be equal to 1 for convergence. After we do this fixing, there is no more uh, gauge symmetry. Mm -hmm. So here is an example of uh, the dynamics, the classical dynamics that follow from this action. Here I just took a two-dimensional plane and projected it to the cylinder. And as you can see, it's uh, non-trivial. Maybe it reminds you maybe a group of fishes together. So let's do uh, an example of how uh, we solve this action. We'll take it the same example as we talked before, just two uh, particles. And <coughs> on the constraint that x1 dot x2 equal to minus 2, which was L equal to 1, as I said before, one can always bring these two uh, five, uh, these two uh, <coughs> vectors, take the following form, 
where s and phi are some function of the time. This function is just determined directly from symmetry. s is related to dimension, and phi is related to the speed. What we have to do next is to impose the Virasoro constraint that tells us that the kinetic term are equal in both sides and equal to one. And once we plug it in, we automatically reproduce the correct classical spectrum of the j equal to two fishnet model that's drawn up in. Next thing to do is to compute the correlation function, the four point function. And this is a bit of a shooting problem. You set the two particles at some initial time and some uh, distance between two and let them circle around. You have to find the time after which the two conformal cross ratio are equal to uh, theta and rho. Then you plug it back into the action and you reproduce indeed the correct four point function at stone cup. So this is indeed the <laughs> classical uh, description that describe the fishnet model headstone coupling. And we see it indeed live in one higher dimension, which is the light cone of R1,5. What I want to uh, also mention about this classical model is that it turned out to be also classically integrable. What it means to, for a discrete model to be integrable in the classical limit, yes? The, the given classical limit that you really need an extra dimension, if you had taken your action with four dimensions, yeah, so what, what do we mean by uh, holographic? I want two things. First, I want to be a strong weak duality, which is guaranteed by the fact that you have the tooth coupling in front of the action, which was also true in four dimension. But the second thing we want to do is to have locality in the higher dimensional space. What it means, locality in the higher dimensional space, it means canonical kinetic terms and only nearest neighbor interaction. And it's really this what force us to lift to a higher dimension and also result in the Virasoro type constraint because the number of degrees of freedom did not change by this lift. What it means for a classical discrete model to be integrable? For a classical discrete model to be integrable, it means that you have to find uh, two matrices, call them L and V, that satisfy the zero curvature condition, which we take the time derivative of one of them, we'll get this form of uh, <laughs> zero curvature condition that tells us that if we now to take the time derivative of trace of product of any of them, this will be time independent because this time will telescope between the nearest neighbor. Mm -hmm. Now in, for this model, we find that this L and V are very simple. L is just made of the conformal generators that acts on the <coughs> axis in this form. U, again, is just a parameter which is called the spectral parameter. And V is made of the same form, but within a site in the neighboring one. Once you, uh, the equation of motion in this coordinate tells you that Q dot is the difference of 2J. With this equation by itself tells you that the total charge, of course, is conserved. But this equation is equivalent to show to the zero curvature condition. Therefore, this model is classically integral. So the next thing I want to talk about is here is the classical model to describe the fishnet at strong coupling. Let's try to quantize it. So warm up that a uh, warning that if we do the same thing in n equal to four, starting from a classical string, the only thing we could know how to do is the first or the second semi-classical correction in one over the tooth coupling. Okay. Here we we'll take now this model and try to quantize it. What it means to uh, quantize the model, so if I wrote the Hamiltonian that is equivalent to the action that is written before, just p squared times uh, <coughs> this product of interaction. By the way, this product of interaction looks like everything is squeezed together. But one has to remember that there is a Virasoro constraint. What really determines the dynamic are the equation of motion. When you write the equation of motion, you find that there is only nearest neighbor interactions. In this. What are the constraints? The constraint is that we have to live on the light cone, so x squared equal to zero. This was the uh, Polyakov type gauge that we pick, that the kinetic term square is equal to one. And this is uh, another constraint that follows by basically taking the time derivative of x squared equal to zero constraint or by the Poisson bracket of it with the Hamiltonian. 
And of course, we have the Hamiltonian unconstrained that tells us that we have time reparameterization symmetry. What it means to quantize such a quantum mechanical problem means first to introduce a Poisson bracket. The second step will be to improve the Hamiltonian. What I mean to improve the Hamiltonian, to add to it pieces that are proportional to the constraint such that when we take the Poisson bracket with the rest of the constraint, we will not generate new ones. Also, the danger that you will generate infinite set of constraints. So in order to do that, you can always improve the Hamiltonian. The next thing is to close the set of uh, constraints. And we will do that, find that some of them are first order, some of them of second order. The moment that we have second order constraint, we have to introduce, instead of Dirac bracket, instead of Poisson bracket, Dirac bracket. Dirac bracket are correction to the Poisson bracket that put you back on the space of constraint. And then the quantization is replacing the Dirac bracket by uh, commutators, imposing, we will impose the constraint on the Hilbert space, and finally we impose the Hamilton and constraint, the quantum Hamilton and constraint, and read the spectrum. This is a bit of a long chain, so let me uh, jump first to the bottom line of what we get when you go through this chain of quantization, and then only uh, flash the important steps. So when we do that, the outcome of the quantization, we find that at the quantum level, we are studying a wave function in ADS5, okay, of J particles in ADS5, not on the light cone. Each uh, one of these particles have to satisfy that the second Casimir of it is equal to minus three, meaning that it describes for you a massive particle in ADS, which is dual to an operator of dimension one. These are the original scalars of the fishnet model. Okay. And the Hamiltonian unconstrained become the following constraint of this wave function. So here Q are again, now the conformal generators acting on the ADS coordinates. So Q squared here is a matrix in this uh, six dimensional space. It will take the product of these matrices ordered along the chain and then close the trace. Now, this double dot is like a normal ordering, meaning that when we take the, the square, we have to uh, deal with some ordering ambiguity. And this is the symmetric traceless combination. So this is what describes uh, the quantum model. And uh, after going through all this step and deriving it, we came out with a very straightforward proof for it for any length. It turns out that if one takes the graph building operator that I talked about before and invert it, already in the four dimensional theory, this can be written as such a trace of Q squares. But now Qs are the conformal generator in 4D. Once you do that, tell you automatically that if I start with a wave function in four dimensions, here I uh, replace the small axis by big axis, meaning we're going to embed in space. This big axis represents four dimensional embed in space. This wave function, when we integrate the four dimensional wave function against boundary to bulk propagators, is a solution to these constraints. So th in this case, this is the explicit map between the boundary wave function and the ADS wave function. Let me uh, now flash the uh, <laughs> main ingredients of the quantization and how we led by quantizing this model to this description. So the first step was to improve the Hamiltonian. And it turns out that if one take the trace of these Q squares at the classical level, they're equivalent to the original classical Hamiltonian I wrote plus higher powers of the constraints. So for the space of constraint, they're equivalent. And these are the constraint again, x squared, we are on the light cone, and p squared equal to 1, and this one follows. The next thing is to close the system of constraint, and when we close them, we find that these two constraints are second order, while this one is first order. And it means that we have to introduce a, post, a Dirac bracket, and I would not write it explicitly, but the important point of it is that the x's do not commute anymore. Dirac bracket between two x's do not commute. However, the Dirac bucket between the mo conjugate momentum, the P's, are not exactly the conjugate momentums anymore, do commute. 
Therefore, now when we quantize and replace the Dirac bracket by a uh, normal bracket, the fact that the <coughs> momentum commute means that we can use them to parameterize our real space, to parameterize the wave function. We choose to parameterize them by what I call y here, which is the conjugate uh, variable to p. But this conjugate y is not exactly x, because the y commute, but the x's do not commute. Okay. And they turn out to be related by a very simple form. Here y, plus this correction, this is the relation between y and x. Now, once you plug this, <laughs> the relation, into one of the, cons this co the CJ constraint, it is automatically satisfied. Mm -hmm. These two terms just cancel each other. This one and this one. I have to warn you that both here and here, we are multiplying now two operators that do not commute. And therefore, when what I wrote here, there is uh, actually an ordering ambiguity, but it doesn't matter which ordering you pick. It has no physical effect. The order in here has to follow. <coughs> Next, we have the uh, x squared constraint. But now at the quantum level, x squared becomes just this quadratic Casimir for a single scalar, for a single leg of this wave function. And for the scalar sense, they have dimension 1. This quadratic Casimir is minus 3. It kind of tells us that at the quantum level, x squared is no longer 0. It gets quantum correction which is of order 1 over chi square. This is how we see ADS starting to appear from the quantization. Most importantly, we have to impose the constraint. Again? We have to use the constraints. X times P is 0. It becomes. When you write the question, when you write the, quanti the quadratic Casimir in terms of the generator, it doesn't matter if you write it in terms of the y's or the x's. This term cancels out. It becomes the quadratic Casimir with written in terms of the y's. Okay, and you use the text of P. <coughs> so, the most important one I think is the constraint that tells the P square equal to one, and in the y space it just becomes the box y equal to chi square times the wave. And written it in, <coughs> again, in this coordinate, I'll call R here the overall scale of Y. So Y squared with a minus sign is defined to be R. This becomes just a radial equation for R, which what stands here is, again, the quadratic Casimir at a single side for a single scale. We know it is equal already to minus 3. So this equation basically determines the radial shape of the wave function. One can solve it explicitly and tell you that the original wave function in terms of the y's is equal to the solution to this radial equation, which is just the Bessel function, times a function of j coordinates in ADS. And we scale out the overall scale. Okay. So this is how we see that all the, di the dynamics really take place in ADS, and this trivial part is just completely determined by the constraint. So we see that from the classical level, the quantum level, we are in ADS. The last step would be to uh, impose the Hamiltonian constraint. This was the Hamiltonian constraint classically. And it turns out that the quantum Hamiltonian, as we discussed before, is given by this trace of sort of normal order or symmetric traceless Q squared. Let's see how this works in practice for an uh, example. So there. The simplest example, again, I want to consider is the example now of two particles in ADS. So we have a wave function that depends on two coordinates of ADS, Z1 and Z2. First, <coughs> we have to impose that each one of them behave like a massive particles in ADS with mass square equal to minus 3. And second, we have to fix the global charges to be delta and S. So now, now one can solve it explicitly, directly, or one can use, uh, for example, Witten diagram. There is a single bulk vertex that <coughs> can connect an operator with some dimension and spin to two scalars in ADS. So this Witten diagram basically computes for you the wave function. When one does that, 
in post Hamilton and constrain one reproduce the finite coupling spectrum. So we see that the quantization of this model produces the, the spectrum of the fishnet model at finite coupling, okay? not just at the leading <coughs> quasi classical level. Another thing uh, <laughs> we can do so far, I only discussed what we call the U1 sector. This was a trace of operator that only carry charge under one of the two U1 symmetries. But more generally, we can consider an operator here, for example, that afford for this uh, neutral uh, <coughs> chain of uh, phi 1 and phi 2, have an extra phi 2. So this is operator that also cut the charge under the rotation of the second scalar. And here we had only wheels. Then the corresponding Feynman diagram to contribute to this one look like spiral. This extra phi 2, only thing it can do in perturbation theory is spiral around the phi 1 lines. So as opposed to uh, before, now at one of the position of the wave function, we have not a single propagator ending, but two propagators. One is the original phi 1, and another one is the extra phi 2 that is spiraling, spiraling around the diagram. But everything basically almost go through. The difference, uh, so the difference in the, <laughs> between the, in the dual description between these two turn out to be uh, very small. There is no difference in the classical limit at all. At the quantum level, the only thing that changed is basically the quadratic Casimir associated with these sites. Okay? That instead of being minus 3, become minus 4 in this case. Okay. But this is only correction that is seen at the quantum level. Now, <laughs> the inclusion of the ability to have sites with two scalars ending and not one re reveals uh, a new sign of discrete reparameterization symmetry of this problem that already exists even in this case. What we did here to choose a wave function basically took the Feynman diagrams that contribute to the correlation function of this operator and choose a way to cut them out, such a way that you can generate all Feynman diagram by, in this case, would be by iteration of the wheels. Okay? But there are many, many different ways of cutting the diagram, and the result, the physics should not depend on that. Here is an uh, example. This is uh, uh, such a <coughs> Feynman diagram that contributes to the correlator with one phi two insertion that is spiraling around. And here we see two different ways of, cap of cutting the same diagram. And they relate to a uh, different wave function. One have these uh, sites with two propagator anion that we call magnons. They're next to each other. And the other one, they are not next to each other. One can introduce an operator that shift, take us between the two. And we've proved that this is indeed a symmetry, a full symmetry of the quantum model. Okay? This is like a gauge symmetry, which is a remnant of reparameterization. So does the number of sides change? No, the number of sides does not change. But you can also consider like a cutting. But here we only consider, a, a <coughs> yes. Here we only consider a, cut, a cutting where you can reproduce all diagram by iterative uh, study. If I do something like that, it will not be of this form. This basically uh, restrict the number of propagators at the end at a given site to be a single one, two, or even three, but not that. I'm going too fast, I guess. Questions? The number of sites is always the same as the number of uh, phi ones in the trace. Okay. But you also have some like that yellow dots. Yellow dots are just uh, to emphasize where do we cut? Where do we go for the phi to propagate or to map it to here? It's just to map the two pictures. Yeah, nothing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? thing that I will not uh, talk about too much is uh, integrability. 
before we talked about the classical integrability of the model, but this description allows us to prove the full quantum integrability of the model and uh, write what is called the Baxter PQ relation that determined the spectrum of this model completely at finite coupling, which is the analog of the solution for the spectrum for n equal to 4 for the fishnet model. So here, for example, we see a numerical plot of the dimension of this operator that has 3 phi 1 and 1 phi 2, for example, as a function of the complex tooth coupling. And you see it has several branches, an interesting structure. Uh, you know, so one can prove that uh, reparameterization of the cutting becomes just a symmetry of this, uh, do this integrable description. Many in different cuts lead you to exactly the same equations. Let me uh, summarize. So, <coughs> main thing we, we found here is a derivation, exact first principle derivation of a duality between a four dimensional CFT, which was the fishnet theory in the planar limit, and a chain of particles in ADS5. Duality is weak strong, meaning that we take the coupling to be strong, we, the dual description becomes classical, and we can compute dimensions or correlation function by solving classical equation of motion subject to constraints. <coughs> One of the important uh, thing about, again, about a local, about, <coughs> about holography, apart from being a weak, weak strong duality, is the fact that the dual description is a sort of local. In that case, it's a, as much as a discrete model can be local, meaning that this particle at a canonical kinetic term and therefore described by local particle in ADS and only nearest neighbor interaction. <coughs> uh, this integrable model we could not find it anywhere in the literature. It seems to be a new integrable model. And we saw that quantizing this model just following the textbook uh, description lead to the exact finite coupling spectrum of the fishnet model in the planar limit. Uh, from future direction, here we only discussed a single, a single string state, like a quantized single string. What one would like to do is to include one over n correction. There is to include the, what we call the fish chain vertex, which allow this chain to split into two. <coughs> There are, uh, this model has many, many uh, what we call protected states. These are operators that do not receive any loop corrections. Okay. And one compute Feynman diagrams and don't find any correction to their anomalous dimension. For example, for length two here, we, find we found only two operators, which was of twist two and twist four. But of course, the theory has an infinite tower of any twist and all the, all the higher twist operators turn out to be protected. One would like to incorporate them, it will be like a free theory, in the dual description. One thing we plan to do is that this seems to be an ideal playground for uh, <coughs> using the separation of variable program for computing correlation function in integrable theory. Not that the um, fishnet ty type diagrams are kind of the diagrams that give you wrapping corrections when you then generally do integrability. This is a bit the opposite limit of the asymptotic limit, where you have only nearest neighbor interaction. All the diagrams completely wrap the full operator. Mm -hmm. Can go away from the fishnet model. And for example, what interesting thing to, would be to do is to introduce back the original toothed coupling of n equal to four. And now we can, one can do it systematically, order by order in the tooth coupling. For example, find the first order correction to the graph building operator, the first order correction to the Hamiltonian of the dual description. This is like introducing back the original radius of ADS in units of L spring. There are many other uh, models. For example, one would like to include uh, the other uh, free parameter families of fishnet in particular the supersymmetric one, one of the reasons is that they are expected to be conformal also at finite n. There are uh, 3D and uh, 6D analog, including the ABJM model. And lastly, <coughs> one would like to also study other dimension, 
in one model with a very similar diagrammatic is the SYK model. It will be interesting to try to apply different similar ideas there. Thank you.